was going to say coming here today, but nobody's come anywhere. We're all in the same place. We've always been. So thanks for attending. Um, just before we start, and with everybody's uh, agreement, I want to move item number six on the agenda, um, the office accommodation item, just to after item number two, um, home working scheme. I think those two things flow in better like that. Um, if everybody's in agreement, we're okay with that? Yes, agreed. Lovely, thanks, Vera. It's good to hear a voice coming back. <laughs> Um, so the next um, item, what is item one, declarations, anything on that? No, item two, home working scheme and it's, uh, up, the update. Um, and is that yourself, Fiona? It's going to be Linda Cullen that will take this item. Thank okay, you. thanks, Linda, if you're ready. Thanks, Marie. So... This report aims to give a brief overview to members of the JCC on the position regarding home working and the associated home working scheme. Section 1 of the report reminds us that the home working scheme was initially introduced last October for a temporary period of six months in response to the COVID-19 restrictions, in particular the requirement to work from home. So whilst we were hopeful that an extension would not be required, as explained at 1.2, increased transmission rates and the strategic rollout of the vaccination programme required us to review the position and the decision to extend the home working scheme for a further period of one year from the 1st of April was presented and approved at the Finance and Resources Committee on the 11th of March this year. The communication strategy advised at 1.4 of the report has since been implemented, with both managers and employees being fully aware of the extension. Further communications are also planned to remind staff about the support available to them whilst working from home. The beginning of section two of the report explains further why the home working scheme has had to be extended, with the emphasis being on the health and safety of our employees and the need for everyone to be afforded the opportunity to be vaccinated. 2.2 also advises that the Council during the next year will consider the wider plans for returning staff to offices and consider its future operating model in line with the plan for North Lanarkshire. 2.4 highlights that the initial home working scheme has been revised following trade union concerns regarding the application of working time and business mileage while working from home. As outlined, these areas of the scheme have now been amended to reflect the guidance provided by both the Working Time Directive and HMRC tax regulations. 2.5 explains that we currently have approximately 800 employees participating in the scheme, and as managers are finalising the returns regarding who should continue in or join the scheme, we estimate that this figure will increase by approximately another 700 employees. 2.6 and 2.7 confirm that throughout the period of the home working scheme being in place, dialogue will continue with employees in the trade unions with any areas of concern being addressed at the earliest possible point. Future changes to the Council's operating model will, of course, be subject to the normal trade union consultations. 2.8 to 2.11 of the report highlight the salient points of the home working survey that was carried out in December last year. 2.9 provides a snapshot of the positive results, and it's interesting to note that the majority of staff found working from home either easier or the same as being in the office, with many highlighting the benefits of a better work-life balance. Notably, access to and support for online managers was reported as being good, with employees feeling well supported. 2.10, however, outlines some of the areas of focus for improvement, with some staff feeling isolated working from home and others highlighting a need for managers to engage more with staff to inquire about their health and wellbeing. As outlined at 2.11, we will undertake regular surveys of the staff participating in the scheme during the next year, and we will continue to work with trade unions and managers to address any issues or areas of concern. Points 2.12 to 2.16 outline the next steps, including the requirement to issue employees participating in the scheme with variations to the contracts, ensure that key messages and reminders of support are issued on a regular basis, and that further surveys are carried out with appropriate consultations taking place with the trade unions on any changes required to the home working scheme. Finally, 2.14 indicates that the Council will transition to a more blended model of working with a mix of home and flexible office accommodation, which, according to the home working survey results, is a very desirable option for our employees. So that's a really quick tour around the report, but happy to take any questions. Thanks, Linda. Um, any questions for Linda on that report? I don't see any indications. Um, so thanks very much for that report, Linda. Can we move on to um, the next item, which was previously item number six? 
um, office and service delivery accommodation. And I think, James, you were going to speak to that for us. Yes, thank you very much, uh, convener. I've been asked to come along to the idea of an, a verbal update as to, to, to where we are and, and uh, where, where we're going. Uh, so I think uh, what's been agreed within the council's recovery group and within other forums as well is we'd be looking, we'd be working towards uh, returning five uh, offices uh, for occupation when uh, restrictions uh, start to allow us to do that. Uh, those offices have been agreed, those buildings have been agreed as Buchanan Centre in Cope Bridge, Bolesworth Centre in Wishaw, the Dale Building in Motherwell, Scott House in Motherwell, and the Civic Centre in, in Motherwell as well. And any any moves as we, we move forward in relation to office recovery, that will have to be fully implemented in line with the Scottish Government uh, guidance, which is which, which comes out and, and uh, continues to come out as we go forward. Also in line with the Council's recovery. A planning process and also the, the the plan for the council going forward and and, and as you're aware and has been mentioned in the previous report, uh, the, the operating models are getting reviewed in the council as well. Also and probably more most importantly, all health and safety considerations will also take will always take precedent uh, when we're looking at this work uh, going forward. And similar to the home working scheme that was that was the previous ag agenda, all heads of service and third tier managers. Have been fully informed uh, about this for twelve months now, and they've been asked to review all their service delivery areas and all their, their service uh, delivery models, and to keep the communication and engagement going with staff uh, throughout the, the process. Also important as well, I advise the committee that our, our approach is clearly in line with a recent report, a report that came out last Monday from the Scottish Futures Trust. We are, what we are doing is we are going to be looking as we go forward the new model within the council, uh, looking at what's been referred to as the, the three H's: home, head offices, and also hubs uh, going forward as, as, as well. So that has been a, an approach that we've been taking now for a, for a, a good part of twelve months. There's a mix of uh, work styles that have been be, been uh, been developed, and our colleagues in HR are continuing to work on that 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 with us. Uh, that is getting done through. Uh, heads of service and managers, so they are they are they are identifying staff into the appropriate uh, work styles. It's not been done or been suggested uh, uh, to them. We are making sure that the, the model that will be be going forward, a key a key element will, of it, will be the empowerment of staff to make sure staff can do their job wherever they wherever they they need to 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 do their job, whether that, that is in the in the office in a particular. Day or days, or whether working in a home, or whether working out on site, etc. So we have to make sure staff feel feel empowered to to choose how how they can they, they can work forward, and then from that we get maximum productivity uh, from that. And a key element of that is 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 the trust that we we, we put put in staff, and 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 we put put a lot of trust in, in staff. And I think the last twelve months has demonstrated the payback that comes back from staff uh, from that trust that's put 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 in place. As I mentioned earlier, the health of staff is a key thing uh, for us going forward, and and and, and equally important, and and, and perhaps in, uh, more important, in some in some areas of the council, the needs of service users have to be fully considered uh, uh, going forward as well. We were looking at uh, office rationalisation prior to the 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 impact of COVID nineteen, and we'll continue to do that. We do have a we, we still we have delivered significant savings. Over the last few years, we are still in the process of having to deliver eight hundred thousand savings over the next uh, two, two financial years, and also as we as we, we look at our office uh, footprint and and all our ancillary accommodation as well, we make an, uh, an impact on our carbon uh, footprint as well. And we've, we've, the council as a whole has has, has had some really uh, excellent results in that over the last two two years or so, and I think that has contributed in part by the work that we've been doing in the in the, in the office estate and the wider estate. We've got good HR uh, practices, and there's very good returns coming back from staff across the council, and that's been mentioned in the previous report in section 2.9. But there is there is challenges as well that was mentioned in in, in section 2.10 uh, of that report as well. And as heads of service and managers, uh, we are encouraged to be openly discussing these things with our staff uh, on an ongoing basis. Service specific items will always be considered as we go forward. There is no one size fit all model, and that has to be that has to be taken into account when we're working uh, with with services. But we will be asking for the models to be signed off at exec executive level within the within uh, services. 
We have a desk and meeting space app that's 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 in place. So when when we can return to the office, uh, the process will be in place for people to start returning to offices as as appropriate. And finally, what I want to say is is we we we've actually, we've actually been doing a lot of work and a lot of projects, as you can imagine, over the last twelve months and over the last two months or so, we've been spending a lot of time uh, working in the vaccination centres and, and and getting them up and running. But but we're back on to the the office accommodation. Uh, with, with, with a lot of energy, and we're planning to take a report to the council management team on the 27th of, of, of April uh, to, to update them where we are, and more importantly, as to the, the way forward. Uh, I think that, that's that's quite important in terms of timescale because it will be the new council management team that will start to be in place uh, round about that time, and also as we're getting closer to the possibility of the Scottish government uh, easing some of the restrictions going forward as well. I think it's uh, I think it's good timing for us to go to the council management team. At the end of uh, next month. Thank you so much for that, James. Um, can I ask if anybody's got any questions on that update? Can I ask, Marie? Sorry, I'm late. Um, just on the, the just on the, the council offices for social work. Would it be appropriate to do that just now? Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, um, James. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I've been involved uh, around this area now for about seven months, um, and I ex accept the fact that the new variant caused some difficulties, but it wouldn't take away from the actual fact that there was a rationalisation of buildings and the recovery and redesign. Uh, however, it seems to just um, go nowhere just now. Um, we seem to be been told months ago that the five main buildings that are going to remain open, and we know them, three of them is in Motherwell. However, we've got major problems with the social workers uh, coming and the social work assistants coming to us um, with regards to the lack of space that seems to be um, almost not, not negotiated as yet between the heads of social work services and yourselves, or yourself even. Um, I have raised this at IGIB level with Ross. I've raised it at the political level with both the leader uh, of the, the two main parties, SNP and Labour. And um, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, James. Uh, I'll give you an example. We have a situation in Bells Hill where during the pandemic, um, 95 Main Street was closed without very little warning. That, in fact, all the paper social work files are still there. The social workers were moved to the John Mann Centre, um, which was inappropriate. Um, myself and Willie Shearer, the branch uh, chair, uh, had a few, um, a number of health and safety meetings there. Uh, and we asked, because Willow Bank, the annex was closed. Now it's reopened, and I believe, and in, in my information is correct, that there's, they've got facilities for four or five duty workers there. Um, so we've went from having the big, the original Main Street social work in Bells Hill office closed, then it moved to um, the John Mann Centre. We've shut, we've shut 95 Main Street, and we're not getting anywhere uh, fast in this. We've got situations now where we've got statutory supervision um, um, of children and of adults, uh, um, support and protection issues. We've got case conferences needed. We've got contact for children. That is a statutory right we do that. We can't have social workers sitting in park benches trying to facilitate contact. We're going to be in the front page of the papers, and I make I don't I'm not happy about having to say this, but something needs to change um, with between the corporate corporate decision making with regards to social work facilities and and the social work management. We're going nowhere with us after this length of time. So can you give us any information about what we're doing what, for talking sake, Bells Hill? Can you reopen 50, 95 Main Street again? Because that allows conference facilities and contact facilities and canteen facilities for the social workers, both in child protection and in adult support and protection. It is vital. It's a, a vital service that we have for the service users. And just to use your words, James, since I come in, you said empowered. The staff need to be empowered. They need to be trusted. And also the needs of the service users have to be adopted. Surely these three things 
have, have the exact opposite of what's happening in the last seven or eight months of social work, trying to negotiate these offices. Thank you. Fiona, do, um, do you want in for a comment and then we'll go to James if you want to reply to that? So, Fiona? I'll let James respond first, Marie, and then I'll just come in on the back of that. It's just about um, work going forward. So, in you come, James, first. Nothing that we just say there, John, which I, 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 I disagree with, but I, I probably at the end of, I think, and I may have picked up wrong, wrong there, you're saying that things haven't moved forward, things are going backwards. I would, I would probably suggest that is not the case, but certainly. Uh, the, the, the whole whole, whole uh, thrust of what you say there, uh, I absolutely I, I, I agree with. In terms of you know, I think what I want, want to advise first of all is there's fortnightly meetings between asset and procurement and uh, social work social work services. So and there, there is no point in any of these discussions if we say this is what will happen and this is which this is the way in which it, which will which will happen. The point at which you came in at, 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 at the meeting is. These principles are absolutely uh, critical, and I would, I would be, I would, I would think it would be very surprising if people were sitting in park bench and benches having the, the types of discussions uh, that you refer to. And that's certainly not the model that would have to be in, in, in place uh, go, going forward. Uh, you know, so uh, as I've mentioned, I, I think you were may, maybe at this point. I'm not sure. Uh, we can look at accommodating all service needs uh, going forward, but it has to fit into the, the, the corporate model. There does not need to be a conflict be between that. The, the examples you use there are clearly different from what would be normal activity within within council council services. Uh, the council management team has commissioned a group of, group of officers to look at the operate, operating uh, model across the, the council. That will include social work, that will include education, that will include CLD, that will include all the services uh, of the council. In relation to uh, any engagement with heads of service or other managers within social work, uh, I don't have any problems with that, and I would I would I would welcome that because I think uh, we are not putting any uh, uh, restrictions in place. That would that would suggest the things that are happening and put that are happening should be, be be happening. So we that that can be looked at going forward. I'll just finish off by the thing which is, uh, the, the point I made at the start is there's fortnightly meetings going on between asset and procurement and and and, and social work. So all of these things can be easily resolved. And it, it, it actually surprises me if they're not getting resolved. To be honest with you, in relation to Bell Hill, which is which is a specific example. I'd have to take that with with the meeting, but I think what you're referring to is probably the the closure of Emma J Road, which was which was a, a couple of years ago, or, or so. And my understanding, I'll need to no. go and check this. That staff have been relocating to 95 Main Street, have been relocating to Sir John Mann Centre, and have also been using the former Willow Bank Annex and Cavan Newman High School as well. I need to check the detail of that. Well, thank you, James. But um, I, you can if you don't mind just to respond. 95 Main Street was shut um, very quickly within a couple of days of the pandemic uh, and th um, the workers were relocated to Willowbank. So that's not been open, James. I find it astonishing, James, that we're nine, what, six or seven or even eight months down the line and you're saying to me there that you would welcome to speak with the heads of social work and you're leading on this and they... And I, and I have raised this through the IJB and we, at the JCCs of social work, and you're telling me you haven't met the heads of service in social work. I find that astonishing because what it seems to me is, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way in any way, but people who are not social workers are making decisions about whether social work offices should be opened or closed to beat an £800,000 budget. Well, we'll end up in the front page of the papers, I can assure you, James, if we don't get this right. Um, and, and that's and that will be in no one's interest. So we need to move in this, and we need to move on it as a matter of absolute urgency before our members come to us and say enough is enough, and let's and, and what else can we do as as a trade union for them? And there's plenty, as, as you know. So we don't want to go down that route, but this cannot continue, James. Thank you. Do you want to respond to that, James? Yeah, I think I think uh, I'd like to clarify. Sorry, but maybe it come across there that I would be willing to speak to to, to heads of service and others in social work. Apologies, if that's the way it's came across. Uh, I have certainly spoke to to heads of service and social works and, and other managers in social works uh, on a regular basis. Uh, social work and representation in the council's uh, recovery group, uh, which is a head of service uh, level. Uh, social work have representation in the council's silver group. 
which is at head, head of service level as well. Social work have representation in the council's management team as well. So if, if it, it's, apologies if that came across as if I would welcome speaking to the heads of service and, and, and social work. That's not how 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 uh, I, I was intending uh, to present. That. And uh, and there is discussions as I, as I mentioned uh, previously. There is fortnightly meetings going on between social work and and uh, heads of uh, uh, sorry and asset and procurement and discussions over in Main Street are are part of those those, those uh, meetings at the present time. Thank you, Councillor Barclay. Thanks, uh, Marie. Um, I I was going to the there's a, a few questions, but John has covered um, really all of it. Apart from the, we can understand about the the rationalisation of offices, and that the they're going to be into the the five main ones. But obviously, I'm getting queries and concerns that are coming to me as a Cumbernauld councillor. The fact that there's you're, you're talking about the biggest town in North Lanarkshire, that there's nothing in Cumbernauld south of the Northern Corridor. Now, any when I've brought it up in, in question before, it's going down the the level of talking about the hub model. Now, there's there's still that's at an early stage, and um, it's. People are having concerns, and as it's going out into the wider community, again, it's talking about that everything is getting moved away from Cumbernauld in the Northern Corridor, Cumbernauld and Coast South in the Northern Corridor, and moving towards Motherwell and elsewhere. Uh, can you offer reassurance that there will still be social work within Cumbernauld, especially? And how can you make sure to put that information out there to alleviate people's concerns? Because the, the concerns are, are becoming um, increasingly, there, there's more and more of them. And it's not just coming from staff that are going through the trade unions, but obviously through the staff's families, it's starting to come out into the community. And as that is coming to us as elected members. Thanks, James. Do you want to come back in, James? Yeah. I'm happy. To come back in that, I think in relation to to to, to Cumbernauld or any area in, in North Lanarkshire, is you know the council has to look at the services it's providing. It has to look at the accommodation which has that have that has in that area. And within Cumbernauld, we have a lot of lot of uh, accommodation which is uh, owned by the council and, and accommodation we also share with with other uh, agencies as, as, as well. And, and and the council for for, for a good period of time now has. Looked at when I say us, I'm not talking about asset procurement. I'm talking about officers to get things better working between services, to get things better working uh, between other public sector agencies uh, as well. And across the council management teams, uh, we're working on that. Within Cumbernauld, there is there, there is plenty of assets which within within the council, plenty of buildings within within Cumbernauld, which uh, staff can staff can can occupy occupy. Uh, there's two brand new high schools that have been recently constructed in, in Cumbernauld, for for example, uh, Cumbernauld Academy, the most the most recent one, the most recent new building in North Lanarkshire uh, Council is an excellent uh, uh, facility. It's a facility where if it was only used by education, I think we would be failing in in what could be achieved out of that facility. That, that's that's just an example uh, that, that that would use. So in terms of hubs being in an early stage of delivery, there is no reason why uh, Cumbernauld Academy. Uh, St Ambrose, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Our Lady's High School in, in Cumbernauld, and even the older ones, St Morris's High School as well, which is very close to 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 to, to an excellent sports facility as, as well, and other facilities as well could be used in a hub model. Uh, at the present time, we don't need to wait for the next new building to to come up for for for, for those things to start taking place, and that that's that's uh, why I made reference to a piece of work which the chief executive has commissioned. A group of uh, chief officers to look at at the moment because we should not be waiting until new buildings come up to, 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 to start doing this this this, this, this work. As to whether the social work will still be in Cumbernauld, I don't manage social work, so I can't answer that question direct direct for you. But I think I don't see any personally. I don't see any reason why social work would would not be operating in Cumbernauld and could not be located in in, in Cumbernauld. But I can't speak on behalf of uh, heads of service and such like in, in, in social work. But I would I would. Find it bizarre if it was not happening that way. Okay, thank you. I don't have any indications of anybody else wanting to. Oh, John. Yeah. Sorry, could I just come back in just for a second on that, Marie? Sorry, sorry. Can I start on you go away. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, I mean, you, you understand, James, that there's elements of social work uh, that that social workers deal with that you couldn't have anywhere near a school. 
Um, so it, it would be, it'd be not just um, not appropriate, be totally inappropriate. And I think it's it's the yes, the the I think Cumberland Academy is absolutely amazing. The work that's done there. Um, you, you've also got Greenfalls High, um, which is a school, and the, the amount that of resource that can put in there. But there's elements that can't, and it's about um, giving reassurance to staff and um, to the wider community that it's not something else that's been taken away, and that that it will be. And the, the put the new hub model that there'll be different things, but the, the moment that reassurance really isn't out there, and it's to ensure that that is taken into account and is, is looked at. Thanks, thanks, Marie. Sorry about that. It's fine, thanks, Councillor. I'll take John, and then I'll take Fiona. Thank you. Um, thanks, Claire. Just said everything that I was going to say. Thank you. That was handy, Fiona. <laughs> Yeah, it was, just, it was just to back up some of what James is saying that controlling access to buildings in the period of the pandemic has been absolutely critical. And um, what's important, John, is, is we know that it's been very, very difficult for social work as a service because of the way they operate. I think the other service who has similarly suffered is housing. However, when we have allowed um, any of these services to bring people into buildings, we've had outbreaks and we will continue to have outbreaks if, if we don't control that. So we are moving into a phase, and James and I certainly have been discussing this recently, where we will be going out to services to ask them to actually sit down and, and outline what their ideal footprint is going to look like. Going forward, they obviously need to take into account that blended model, but it is a it's a big shift for all services to start to map out what that future footprint looks like. And I think working to complete that, certainly in the next month or so, alongside the work that James is doing on buildings, will enable us to get to that future footprint by the time the Scottish Government guidance kicks in and we start seeing offices open in June, July, maybe into August and September. But we must uh, keep in mind that the vaccination programme needs to be well advanced before we consider that. And it will have to be a controlled return or we'll end up sending staff home if we have outbreaks. So that's, that's just the final point I want to make. Thank you. Thanks for that, Fiona, and thanks, James, for your report. Um, <clears throat> if we can move on to... Marie, can I come in? I'm sorry, I've tried to put myself in the chat bar, and I think Heather wants in as well. Um, yeah, I can't get like... in the chat bar. Apologies for putting in, so that's okay. Just then, just on the, if I don't, so a good discussion, and John raised the point, as he did with IJB and, and Gemini on a few occasions, but I think we need to come... This is, I think, specific, as John is saying, to the role of what social workers doing during the pandemic. Um, and, I, and I think we need to come out here with an action point, if, if James and Fiona, to give us that reassurance that contact we made with John, this issue will be taken forward, because he has raised it, to be fair, so John has raised it on a number of occasions. I don't think the reassurance is there, um, certainly from what John is saying. So I think we need to somehow take this forward so there is reassurance to the staff who are doing the job on the front line. And it's very specific to the pandemic from what John is saying. The second point I want to make is just, James, going to your, um, thanks for your update about the the office um, and what we're doing direct to travel, but it's also just that reassurance, you know, the, the world we were in a year ago is different from the world we're in now and the world we're going to be in coming out of this. You know, a big thing is about space and, and as Fiona said about health and safety, is at the heart of it, uh, the welfare of our staff is at the heart of it. We don't really know, we've got no certainty of knowing what direction travel will be in in the next few months, never mind the next year or so. Um, so it's just to make sure we're building into our plans, you know, that we will have capability for our staff to go to work safely in whatever that environment is. Um, and we still don't know yet what's going to happen with all the health and safety legislation. I know we're going to go on to this in the next agenda, but people may not get vaccinated or choose not to be vaccinated. Then what happens if they go into the workplace, etc.? So I think there's still a lot of big issues to be um, factored in. I think we have to, you know, live in the reality of the world we're in right now and could be going into, which is full of uncertainty, and make sure we've got that flexibility to the model offers us that flexibility in terms of office accommodation to the staff can when they need to be in the office, be in the office, but also in a safe way, which I'm sure, yeah, as you've said in your presentation, that's at the heart of it all. Thanks, Councillor Kelly. Uh, you mentioned an action point there. So do you, um, what specifically were you suggesting? I think well, uh, if Fiona and, and James can certainly take away what John has said and, and take up with the appropriate uh, individuals in the council um, and come back to us, and also to just dialogue with John, who knows the specifics of it, um, and, and come back to us to tell us what, what actions are, are coming from it, so we can address this. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Um, Councillor Brandon McVeigh. 
thanks ever so much, Marie. Um, hi, everybody. It's just a reflection on a comment that, that John made uh, about the, the service user statutory rights and the way in which they perhaps may be limited because of the environments that have been worked in. Can we ensure that the safeguarding work that we're doing for our, our staff uh, and ensuring that they've, they're in safe working environments, but also that we are fulfilling the statutory obligations and rights of our service users as well? Because if not, as a you know, as a body corporate, we are corporate parents, uh, and otherwise, you know, we would have children, young people, and indeed vulnerable adults being prevented from um, engaging with the rights that, that should be protected. So I think, so I suppose my question on this is, how are we ensuring that this isn't a functional conversation about accommodation, and is actually about the safeguarding of our staff, but also the statutory rights of our service users, to make sure that that's within the mix? Thanks, Councillor. If we could take that forward, then can I suggest to Lynn James that, that that's part of the considerations for coming back to us? Yeah. You're on mute, Mary. Yeah, I just realised that. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, can we move on to agenda item number three, mental health and wellbeing? Sarah, are you going to speak to this? Yes, I am. Thanks, Thank convener. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, so, members, I'm hoping will be aware of the Council's mental health and wellbeing strategy and our offering that's available for staff through WorkWell NL. This report today aims really to give an overview of the work that's underway and planned. If I could point just to section 2.1 in the first instance, um, that section aims to highlight the need to review our offer on a regular basis so that we're able to respond um, quickly where new resources or support is needed. And it particularly takes into account a number of factors or considerations that, that, that we have to bear in mind, particularly during this year. Um, I won't go through these in detail, but just in summary, um, it is the lasting impact of COVID and the health and safety of our employees that's been talked about already um, this afternoon, and I know that my colleague Fiona will cover that later. Um, the level of change that's going on across the workplace is well at the moment, so whether that's digital transformation or restructures creates concerns for job security and stability as well, and the new digital ways of working in agile ways um, in that home, that head office and hub model that, that James talked about earlier, as well as our continued drive to reduce absence, particularly where um, it's around mental health. Section 2.1 um, also stresses the importance of joined up efforts across our services and with our partners so that we're aligned to our Lanarkshire's mental health and wellbeing strategy and the good mental health for all vision that we have. Many of the themes across our services and our partners we are finding are the same and in summary the priorities moving forward which you'll see referenced throughout the report in sections 2.2 and 2.3 and 2.4 are to continue to develop a supportive culture and a supportive workplace and a climate of well-being to support employees through a good quality work well NL offer um, that, that's practical and that we're able to adapt and change that as, as we know the needs change. Um, and a big focus during 2021 and 22 will be training and support for our managers in line with our new supporting attendance policy that's still to be approved through full council. And that's to support managers to take much more preventative and proactive approaches so that they have better conversations with their staff and that they can recognise and spot signs. Section 2.2 highlights the usage and the uptake of our existing work well NL provision. Um, we have, throughout the COVID pandemic, responded very quickly to provide self-guided resources and collaborative learning through webinars. Over 8,000 employees have accessed this um, and over 87,000 staff hits on our work well NL platform and staff in particular have been accessing self-guided information and resources on there. Financial wellbeing remains um, at the front of our minds in helping all our staff make the most of their income and particularly where they may have been affected in their families through COVID. And in section 2.2, you'll see that our discounted shopping site, um, which would have been more popular um, through COVID as people have been driven online, um, people have actually, or the average spend per user has doubled since this time last year. And you'll see the graph on there. 
Our counselling service as well continues to be used well throughout the pandemic um, and you can see the trends um, when we've either had new restrictions or announcements made or we've had internal campaigns. Section 2.3 um, demonstrates our focus around our commitment to stigma-free Lanarkshire and the climate of wellbeing and the supportive culture that we're aiming to achieve within the Council. And that's also in line with our new supporting attendance policy. It touches very briefly on the, the communications campaign that you may have seen already from our leaders across the community planning partners, as well as our training and development approaches that we have in planning for later this year. Section 2.4 finally um, just talks about other linked training programmes that we have to build both capacity and resilience in the workplace. So that's around the national trauma training commitments that we have, um, our promoting positive behaviour training um, and our equally safe at work programme as well, which we will do more work on during learning at work week um, to support women um, around mentoring and career progression in the workplace. And that's me. Thank you. If there's a happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you, Sarah. Does anybody have any questions or comments? John? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so thanks, Sarah. Um, just two questions, uh, and they both uh, revolve around the training. Do you have a, a time scale for a programme of the training? And my second part of that question is, um, do you want the, or would you wish the trade unions to participate in joint training with you, seeing that we were heavily involved in the strategy development? Thank you. Thanks, John. And I'll, I'll ask Linda to come in then. This is because we're working collaborative with our employee relations colleagues. The timescale for the training we're hoping would be between May and December, John. We have quite a significant population to get through that we're encouraging all managers to take part in this training. Um, and that will take us a while to deliver that. Um, and happy to work on collaborative approaches, as you suggest. And perhaps Linda may have some other co uh, comments as well. Thank you. The only thing I would add, Sarah, is that we've already agreed with the trade unions that we would involve them in the training, but all support and attendance, and that would include, include the mental health um, and wellbeing training that's available. Thanks, Linda. Anybody else want to come in? Yeah. No. Well, thanks, Sarah, very much for that presentation. We'll move on to the next item, which is a health and safety update. Rona, are you doing that for us? Take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as we continue to progress through the pandemic, work is ongoing from a safety perspective as we ensure that we continue to adhere to the Scottish Government and Health Protection Scotland guidance um, so we can protect our employees and anyone else who can be affected by our activities. So I'm just going to cover a few of the points within the Health and Safety Report um, within Section 2. Uh, so, firstly, education uh, work is ongoing in supporting the schools as they've been returning the pupils and in readiness of the full return uh, that will take place after the Easter holidays. The teacher briefings took place last week and support will be provided wherever necessary. For the by-elections, uh, the recent work carried out in partnership with the elections team and trade union colleagues resulted in a very smooth operation. And this has given a good insight into the measures that might be required for the forthcoming May election. Now, this is, of course, to protect those working at the election, but also for the public who come in to vote, the candidates, and basically anyone else who has any involvement um, in the, the smooth running of the election. A uh, video was recently compiled in order to reinforce the mitigating measures that are in place to protect employees and others. This was led by the chief executive and with union colleagues covering the Scottish Government campaign of fact. This was done to try and prevent any complacency from creeping in with the rollout of the vaccine and the forthcoming uh, planned lifting of restrictions. And just a final point to cover, a report proposed proposing a lone worker solution has now been approved by CMT and the safety team are progressing this with the services, union colleagues, IT and finance. So the trial period will allow for two products to be used by selected groups of staff. And this will allow us to put in place a robust loan worker solution. And once feedback is gained from the pilot, then a further report will go to CMT with the results. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone's got. Thanks, Fiona. Um, can, Joanna, you're first. Um, thanks. Um, can I just ask about the uh, forthcoming elections and um, the whether 
you've got any information on the number of staff volunteering to participate in the facilitation of those just conscious that um, there will have to be additional mitigations put in place and there's going to be quite a substantial requirement on staff with regards to those safe distancing um, uh, management of queues outside polling stations potentially um, and uh, the count so if you could give us a bit more detail about that I'd be grateful. Sure Joanna so I don't have the numbers um, of, of, of staff who will work at this that will be held by the elections team but what I can tell you is that risk assessments were carried out for the recent by-elections and um, looking at the the polling stations the count uh, every aspect from start to finish um, of the election so Basically, we've had the opportunity to see how this runs on a smaller scale with social distancing in place, cleaning in place. You mentioned about queuing and um, there was additional staff brought in from a contractor to provide marshalling to make sure queuing didn't take place. Um, if there was anybody, there was somebody somewhere that they could direct them to and um, taking account right down to things like inclement weather. We can't have people stand, you know, people standing outside if the weather's really bad. So. Um, the unions were all sent a copy of the, the three sets of risk assessments that were done for that. And when we did, we did some spot checks of the polling stations as well. Um, and we did have um, one of the union colleagues join us um, for some of that as well. So my, my plan would be that we would do that again um, in advance of the, the main election. We would do some spot checks just to, to ensure that we're, we're happy with the layout. But there was a huge amount of work put into this to make sure that everybody who worked at it was kept safe. But equally, everyone else who was coming in, everyone who had an involvement in it, whether it was the public, whether it was the contractors coming in to set up and, and take down, um, you know, the, the, the equipment, etc. Uh, all of that was looked at. So um, those risk assessments obviously will be reviewed and updated to reflect the, the larger scale event. Um, and all of that was done in conjunction with the, the guidance that was sent out for the running of elections. Thanks, Fiona. Um, Mark, I think you might be able to um, shed some more light on this for us, if you don't mind. Yeah, thanks for that, Marie. Um, as, as part of the election team, um, what I would say at the moment for the um, Scottish parliamentary elections, we've got 384 um, individual polling stations, which will be, um, there'll be a, a presiding officer and polling clerk at every individual polling station. And in, in addition to that, every polling place will have um, what we call runners, which is additional polling clerks that that will um, assist the smooth running of the the actual the, the ballot process. Um, and as Fiona alluded to at the the by election, and um, we had information marshals who were stationed at the the entrance of each polling place, um, to direct um, all all voters to the appropriate polling station. So if you do if you take that, I suppose just kind of notionally. You're, you're, you're talking that you're probably talking the, the best part of a thousand staff will be involved on the day of the election alone um, and at the, the count you, it, which is going to be held over possibly two days then you could maybe add another additional um depending on on where staff work both days maybe another 200 300 staff for that and that's just a rough estimate of of of, of how we're kind of moving forward thank you mark that's really useful um, any more questions on the health and safety report for Fiona or we move on? No. So the next agenda item is the um, 11.40 hours update. I think, Suzanne, you were going to do that for us. Thanks, Maria. Yes, that's right. Um, OK, so um, this report um, seeks to update the committee on the um, up-to-date position with regards to 11.40. Context, I suppose, is the background um, that the Scottish Government effectively um, placed a, a requirement on councils to effectively double the provision from 600 to 1100 hours of childcare by August 2020. Now, that was something obviously that COVID um, had impacted on, and the, the statutory requirement was removed. However, as a council, we took the decision to proceed with that. Um, the challenges around that, so effectively we were being required to double the service provision for the children involved. However, what we were aware of right from this was that there were challenges around the funding for that. Um, the funding was not sufficient for us to simply go out and recruit double the workforce to extend the provision. And that was primarily because our existing workforce, which was at NLC 9 level, 
um, was on average paid around £5,000 more than what the, the market was at that point in time. So we weren't able to go out and recruit double, but also there would have been a significant impact on our partner providers had we done that. Um, and in order to um, address that, we had to come up with fairly imaginative approaches to the, the service delivery. Um, we also had a, a workforce where there had been fairly little development over the previous years, and that was something that we recognised at an early stage. And we also had a workforce where the entry grade was quite high in terms of our uh, larger picture. So again, we had to um, try and address those issues. Section 2.3 in the report um, highlights some of the key principles that we adopted during the process. Um, and one of the things that was absolutely essential to that was our work with the trade unions throughout the, the, the uh, project. Um, we early on decided that that was um, something that was really going to support delivery of the project. And I think we're able to see now that that was the case. We had to indeed um, review our entire model for early years provision. Um, we were um, required to introduce some new grades into our structure. We were also required to introduce um, a new model. So some of our nurseries had to go to 52 week provision. Some of our nurseries had to extend from eight in the morning to six at night. Um, and that was around um, the challenges around that were working with the existing staffing and then supplementing that to make sure that we were able to meet that provision. Um, in addition, we also had to bring some new buildings on stream and update some of our nursery provision. And you'll have seen the Education Convener's recent video that highlighted some of those um, successes. Trade Union consultation was, um, it was a, a collaborative approach. So we had some key meetings, both um, collectively and lots of individual meetings. I think, Marie, you'll be able to support that. Um, where we addressed individual issues um, alongside the bigger picture issues. Um, just moving on, um, section four, two point four tops uh, shows you the uh, levels of recruitment involved um, in the the program. Um, I think the key issues around that to highlight are that we early on identified that we wanted to um, look at all of our promoted posts with. Um, a view to growing our own workforce and making sure that where it was possible to, we would promote and develop our own staff internally. Um, so you'll see that the roles at NLC 9, 10, 11 and 13, which are effectively our early years management um, roles, they were all recruited on an internal level. Um, and that sometimes meant going out two and three times for particular roles to make sure that we were able to um, succeed in um, promoting our own uh, staff. And only under extreme circumstances where we weren't able to, to do so did we go to external recruitment. Um, our external recruitment was primarily NLC 4 level, which is entry level. Um, and our NLC 7 level, um, we were able to pick up mostly through internal recruitment and some external recruitment. Um, moving on, we also were aware of um, additional um, opportunities to, redu to to redeploy some of our own staff from within other areas within the council. So, for example, um, we trained um, 30 career changers um, from other areas within the council um, to an HNC level, and they entered into the workforce at our NLC 7 grade. Um, we also brought on board the remaining classroom assistants who had gone into early years um, Additional, they were, they were called additional support needs assistance in early years. They came across into our support worker roles at NLC4 as well. There were 61 of them. And we also addressed the issue of nursery teachers, and we were able to bring across six of our nursery teachers into newly um, developed roles for them as well. In terms of workforce development, again, that was something that was um, recognised as something that we really wanted to address as part of the project. And you'll see the career pathway that is um, an appendix to the report. There was significant training investment in the workforce, which you'll see at table um, at the table at two point seven. You see the levels of investment that were made over the past couple of years into the, the workforce, and that will continue. We've currently developed a training catalogue, a, a calendar that's out with staff at the moment, um, and our quality officers. We've introduced a network of quality officers. We will be supporting that. 
Um, there is a real commitment on behalf of the organisation to make sure that our workforce continue to develop and are able to access the opportunities that um, are there through the career um, pathway. Um, and that also will support us in succession planning as well, and, and given that it's a significant um, element of uh, the workforce. The challenges around COVID have been significant, which I'm sure you'll all be aware of, and that's about being able to provide um, our existing uh, service and deliver 1140 where we are able to um, in some fairly challenging circumstances. However, we are now fully operating 1140 across the board, other than where COVID particularly creates an issue with that. It is a significantly good news story for the organisation, and um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thanks very much, Suzanne. Any questions from Attendicate? Councillor Backley? It's, it's more a comment rather than really a, a question, Marie. Um, it's just really to, again, to put on record of the the amount of work that has been done to achieve this and the, the staff have been phenomenal. And I, I know that um, the, the staff that I've spoken to and the, the parents as well, that through this whole the, the, the COVID situation, are how grateful that they are. But it's just, I think it's amazing that we've managed to get to this level and it is because of the amount of hard work that has been done and collaboration with the unions and the staff and the staff and everyone within the council. So I just want that to be put on record. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Barclay. Anybody else? Councillor Brown McVeigh. Thanks very much, Marie. Um, I think I really uh, appreciate um, Suzanne's re report today because the the diverse career pathway opportunities that's been there, I think, needs to be emphasised at every turn. It's been collaborative, it's been creative, and the way in which it's enabled people to diversify their role within our organisation and indeed be upskilled and, and uh, receive further training has been really um, creative and quite wonderful. Uh, and uh, you know, where so many families are positive recipients uh, of that, and the learning environments that have been created are, are just um, world class. They they really are, um, and I think. There's been so many lessons about also diversifying a workforce here, looking at underrepresented groups within here. I know that reached out to like um, trainee sports coaches to uh, and, and career changers to to look at bringing more men into childcare. Uh, and I'm just wondering what lessons can we distill from this very active program uh, to perhaps other areas of work to try and remove workplace segregation that we perhaps uh, feel uh, or have that gender stereotyping perhaps uh, in in roles. Uh, going forward. So I'm just wondering how we can take some lessons uh, from uh, this excellent piece of work. Anybody want to respond to that? Maybe I'll maybe bring Sarah in on that. She can maybe comment on some work we're doing, certainly in areas like social work and ASN. ASN is another big challenge. So maybe come in on that, Sarah. Yes, thanks, Fiona. Um, yes, absolutely. I think there are lots of good learnings that we can take from the work that, um, in early learning and childcare, and we are taking these forward. We have started the development of a number of other career pathways um, in social care and social work, and we are looking to apply a lot of the same principles. Um, Jennifer team. Um, I'm looking for Jennifer here, but I know that Jennifer has in place a new workforce resourcing team as well. So we'll be looking at our attraction and our recruitment strategies in particular, how we can um, place much more emphasis um, on reducing inequalities and, and, and increasing the diversity of our workplace. So all very good points and absolutely lots of learnings that we'll take forward. Sarah, I think thank you very much, Suzanne, for your report. I think what I would like to see is that it, that it has been um, a, a long process to get to where the service is in terms of 1140. And it has been a process that the, the trade unions have been involved in since the very beginning. And I don't think it has made it an easier process, but I think it has made it a better process and a better outcome. And I just want to thank the service um, for, that, for their approach to the collaborative working on that. And I think hopefully it's something that we can use and going forward at the other service redesign. So unless anybody else has um, any more questions on the 1140 hours report, that's the end of the agenda. Can I just thank everybody very oh, sorry, Joanna. Sorry, it, 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 it wasn't um, on the 1140, but um, I'd I'd notified you previously of an, an AOB. 
not technically able to take <laughs> ALT. <laughs> Sorry, it was um, just that um, my understanding from our previous JCC that there was due to be a report at this meeting on a recognition for the workforce. Um, I'm just conscious, obviously, uh, we haven't got one. Um, I just wanted to highlight, obviously, the all of the plaudits that have been given to staff um, here at this meeting and over recent times for their efforts during the period of the pandemic and um, make the point that, unfortunately, today, those um, plaudits haven't resulted in them receiving any um, recognition yet of their efforts through their um, pay slips. Thanks. I think there was at the last meeting um, uh, there was to be a report tabled on the recognition um, of staff, and I think we're somewhere still in the in the um, in the machine. So I don't know if that's something that we want to um, bring to the agenda the next time, Fiona. I'll be guided by you on that. Yeah, so obviously we're in the throes of rollout of the five hundred pounds payment that the Scottish Government have now instructed us to apply to a certain grouping of staff. We are in the process of identifying that staff, but the Scottish Government is very tight, so we'll at least have an understanding of who will be eligible for the £500 payment. Um, but I will pick up the point about recognition. Obviously, reward beyond that for the wider group of staff. We've already, as a Council, made our position very clear that all staff should be getting that payment. Um, any local payment, obviously, then is a challenge from a budget point of view, but I will pick up the recognition element of that. I know we did discuss potentially a letter uh, from the Chief Executive in particular, so I'll take that away and discuss it and, and come back to the next meeting. That would be appreciated. I think it's something that is important that we keep on the agenda, and I'm conscious of the fact that we only have these meetings you know, um, quarterly, so by the time we, we meet again, um, we'll have gone through another cycle of um, changes to the way people are expected to respond. And we'll, we're also talking about uh, nationally about pay negotiations. So um, I think it's, um, I know that the Council takes seriously its responsibilities towards recognising staff during this time and all staff. Um, so um, maybe we could find another way to sort of accelerate that work would be really useful. Silence. <laughs> thank you. All right, everybody, thank you so much. A very productive and useful meeting today, and I really appreciate your attendance. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thank you.